in our section, a second sort of methodological lecture on particle filtering, I want to cover some topics that um, I think bear a little bit more uh, discussion, um, uh, clarification, uh, but also um, uh, build s some understanding of intuition and in kind of the mechanics of, of particle filtering. And uh, I was hoping to touch in particular on three topics. Um, uh, one of them concerns the, the, the likelihood functions. And I, I particularly want to talk about the form of the likelihood functions that obtain. Um, second uh, has to do with uh, important sampling um, and in understanding important sampling. And I actually posted some code, some R code to the course site, which uh, some some of you might might find uh, of, of interest. I will be demonstrating it. And, and then, oh gosh, it's misspelled. And then some uh, intuition building, understanding on sort of the role of, of stochastics in these models, um, which plays uh, a key role in sort of keeping our models humble, um, keeping them open to input from, from data. Um, this, this talk will be much briefer than the other, earlier one and mercifully, probably uh, less, um, less intensive in terms of its observations. So we've just seen um, a great little example of application of particle filtering uh, by Isia Yan. And um, uh, I'd like to, to go and, and, and remind us here of um, you know, the basics of, of particle filtering. We talked about how particle filtering involves taking a model, for, for a compartmental model, you could see, could see it laid before you, and then it's sort of stacking it up with different levels of the stack having to do with different particles. Um, but where not all the particles are, are, are equal, right? Um, some of them have higher weights than others. And so when we sample from particles, like Xiaoyan showed in those graphs, those colored, blue colored graphs, that was sampling from particles with the probability of sampling each proportional to its weight. So a particle that has a weight of 0.2 has twice the chance of being drawn as she draws those to plot them out as one with a, a weight of 0.1. Um, the, the weights indicate the, or so-called importance weights indicating its frequency in the distribution, its relative frequency. And at observation points, we compare what a given particle predicts with what's observed empirically and we use this likelihood function for that. Um, and, uh, and that gives us back a value and it's multiplied by the existing weight and then the weights are renormalized. So it's summed up and they're all, all changed by a certain fact, a constant factor to sum up to one. In other words, we divide the unnormalized weight by the sum of the, uh, for each particle, by the sum of the unnormalized weights across all particles. And that makes them all add up to one. Um, so this is the basic gist, but you know, I really didn't talk much about that likelihood function. And, and the likelihood function is important. Uh, there were some questions about it earlier. And um, you know, they for a given particle at a given time, and it has a certain hypothesis about the world. It believes there's a certain number of people in each of the compartments for a compartmental model, or it, believes there's a certain state of the agent-based model or discrete event model for that. Mm. Mm. And it's trying to ask, okay, to compare it with empirical data, we're asking how likely is it, if this is the state of the world as depicted by this particle, how likely is it we'd observe this empirical data we just observed at this time? Um, and I noted that there's several different forms these these distributions can take. Um, uh, some of our earliest work involved binomial distributions. Um, so the idea is like, if, if we had a, a number of cases, we, we said, look, okay, suppose we have some underlying number of new infections for flu. And we say each of them has a certain probability of being recorded 20% at the ascertainment rate, right? P here. Um, uh, that's how we'd model the distribution here. And when we had an empirical datum, 
would apply a binomial likelihood to say, how likely is it that, you know, if you, if you had however many people the particle thinks are getting infected per week, maybe it's 100, um, 100 people, and if the ascertainment rate is 0.2, so you flip a coin with a, with a weighted coin, which has a chance of 0.2 of turning heads up, a um, hundred times, how many, how many do you get? There's a certain probability of observing what's observed empirically, you know, uh, uh, 30, 31. Um, and we'd, we'd assess that through a binomial likelihood. So we'd say, we assume that it's binomially distributed with a probability per coin flip, as it were, P per trial and, and this many trials, the number of infected people. The problem with that we found was that you know, it assigns a weight of identically zero, a weight of zero of, of producing more than, more observations of cases than there are people infected in the model and by the, by the, for this particle, people being infected. So if there's a hundred people being infected, this particle thinks, um, the probability that you observe 101 um, cases is, it's not just small, it's zero because there's no way by flipping a coin, you know, a hundred times, no matter how lucky or unlucky you are, there's no chance it gives 101 heads. Um, so for most of our work, following others in the literature, like Dora Gotti with her work uh, with MCMC a decade ago, for example, and H1N1, um, in our own work with MCMC, um, we made use of a negative binomial distribution. Um, and a negative binomial distribution has the added advantage of having a dispersion parameter R. It has, but, but most notably, it has this advantage of being non-zero um, uh, non for, you know, on its upper and lower side. And so there's some small chance you'll observe something larger than this. The negative binomial has the following form. I, I, I won't go into it in detail, but this is, so the number of infective cases from the model um, here, and this is um, the, 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 the P that, that operates within the negative binomial distribution, but this is what's called a, a dispersion parameter. And we can choose that. And the dispersion parameter makes a big difference. It makes a difference in how wide and how accommodating by extension the likelihood function is. If you give a, 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 a dispersion parameters that's really large, it actually leads to narrow likelihoods. You'll be very critical of anything that's even a little bit different from what the particle thinks should be the case. It will associate with a very low value of the likelihood. By contrast, and again, it's, it's sort of an inverse relationship. If R is small, it will lead to uh, a very broad likelihood they'll be accommodating. So you can have something that's quite far off and still give it some credit in terms of its likelihood. So here's a dispersion parameter of one. Now, all of these that I'm gonna show have a mean value. This is a distribution associated with this likelihood. Um, um, we're gonna sense, you know, um, if, if this is our, the value we expect, um, you know, what's the, the likelihood of, of getting different values? These are uh, these are mean values of a thousand here. So the mean value is this, and this will give the relative likelihood of getting values on different sides. This is gonna still be less than one, but it's gonna be more likely than this. This is a like a dispersion parameter of two. So we're, the first one was this is one. The second one is this is two. Um, and, and watch as this changes, and it helps if I go actually fast here. Dispersion parameter of one, notice it goes from like zero to 3,000. Dispersion parameter of, 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 of zero, of, sorry, of two, goes zero to 3,000, but 3,000 is less likely. Dispersion parameter of four, I'm gonna double it each time. Um, 3,000 is extremely unlikely. Um, of, of eight, you, you can't even see a value here. It's becoming narrower and narrower around 1,000. So a dispersion parameter of 128 is, is really narrow. And you know, if you have this, if you have a dispersion parameter that's really large, what it means is you're gonna be very persnickety about wanting a value 
that's observed that's going to be very close to what this particle expects. And if it doesn't have that, um, if you don't give me that, I'll, I'll give a really low value of the likelihood function. I'm only going to give you a decent value of the likelihood function if you're really close to my, my expectation of particles. It's making particles really picky um, uh, and persnickety. Um, so um, we, we've made really strong use in our work of tuning this dispersion parameter and all Shayan's work. In fact, much of our COVID-19 work you know, really involved tuning those likelihood functions um, and, and not having them be too broad, not having them be too narrow, um, but getting a balance that is not overly picky, but it's not just gonna throw up its hands and say, you know, I'll accept every, everything and equally be equally happy with any empirical data. Um, it turns out tuning them took some, um, uh, you know, took some uh, care and, and it could give really different results. So this is one thing I wanted to talk about. This is one type of likelihood. Soon enough, we're gonna see a different type of likelihood um, with wastewater. But this is a very common sort. And we avoided binomial because it leads to zero weights, it leads to zero values of likelihood function, zero weights, potentially for all particles. And when that happens, all hell breaks loose and, and bad things happen and, and the model is not, is not gonna be very effective. So um, when it comes to the likelihoods, uh, you know, this is, is something which um, uh, you, you, want to, you want something that you can tune a little bit and the performance of the particle filter will often be much better once you've tuned that. And that's one of the things to make Shayan such a virtuoso. She knows how to make a particle filter model sing. Um, um, the right set of the way to get its balance. And this brings me to my second point, which is with these models, there's this key balance. And you see it in the dispersion parameter and you see it especially in the volatility with which these unknown parameters sort of undergo random walks, move around like contact rates. If it's, and, and you, you need a Goldilocks balance here between too much stochastics and, and being too accommodating for being off in terms of the likelihood and being too picky and, and, and persnickety. Um, um, so with stochastics in the model in particular, some stochastics are characterizing genuine stochastics in the world, but some are just a way of introducing into our model a degree of humility, a, a recognition that our model is fallible, that um, you know, we don't know everything about how COVID-19 works. We don't know everything about how mental health develops, how suicidal ideation develops um, uh, given different stressors. And so we wanna introduce um, uh, some uncertainty in our model that reflects the fact that it needs to be open to different possibilities. Um, and another way to achieve that is by broadening the likelihood function. And so much of Shaoyan and Mai's early time in the pandemic and you know, late spring 2020 and beginning of summer of 2020 was spent tuning these things and, and really nailing uh, you know, how to characterize COVID-19. After that, it was, it was a routinized process. We could just run it every day and, and it tended to give very good results. Um, not all the time, but it, it was very, very good, uh, very reliable. Um, so this is key balance. And, you know, I like to think of this balance as a balance we look for in many areas of life. Um, you know, we, we look for it in students, we look for it in faculty. You know, we need we need a situation where we, we avoid overconfidence, just being pig-headed and you know, bull-headed about, I, I want to, um, you know, I believe this and nothing's gonna change my mind. Um, or being, at, at the same time, we don't wanna be underconfident, right? We, we don't wanna be um, just throwing our hands up and say, I have no idea what's going on. You know, I have no clue what's gonna happen. Uh, I don't trust anything that I think e either. We, we want that balance of having a working hypothesis, working on it, um, 
uh, with some degree of confidence, but not being too bullheaded. Um, and this is a philosophical point, um, but it's also a, a very practical point of tuning these models. Um, if we have a model that's overconfident, it's going to have very narrow distributions of its interpretation. That the, there won't be enough stochastics to give it requisite variety. And so if it sees empirical data that's off, it won't be able to fully take advantage of it. It won't be able to really materially adjust because it has such a narrow set of possibilities it's considering. It'll nudge it just a little bit, but it won't really be able to take advantage of surprise data, like data indicating an outbreak is taking place and it's thinking no outbreak is going to take place anytime soon. And it, it's going to take too long to adjust to that. And by that time, the outbreak will be halfway over. Instead, we want it to be able to translate to that, that context, to be woken up and say, oh, oh, that's what's going on. OK, I'll get right on it and, and you know, uh, shift to an understanding of that. At the same time, we don't want it to be so diffuse, so inchoate in its understanding, so blur you know, so misunderstanding, you know, not knowing anything that it thinks anything is possible at any time. Um, and anytime a new data point comes in, it jumps immediately to that interpretation. We want it to have a certain, you know, a, a certain degree of self-confidence that, okay, we'll give this an honest hearing, but I won't jump to conclusions quite yet and, and then shift over. And the way we achieve this is by tuning stochastics and the likelihood function breadth. Um, so, so, so when Xiaoyan tunes a model and makes it sing, a, as she is so capable of, um, um, you know, these are often the things you tune. There are some other things like the initial values, the distribution of initial values and so on. Um, but often you're tuning uh, the volatility of these random walks and, and how many of them there are, that's one thing, and the breadth of the likelihood functions. And using that, you can get this model that's got this good balance of being basically fairly confident but open to surprises and able to take advantage of surprises. Because, you know, in a world of, um, of outbreaks, for example, our world of sudden shifts and ideation. Um, oh, you know, we, we can get surprises. We, we need a model where the some of the particles are kind of already exploring ideas that a surprise is about to take place at any time. So that when, if, if we start to see signals of one, there are these particles ready to go saying, ah, I told you so, I told you so. This is what I've been expecting. This is what I've been fearing. You know, I'm on top of it. And those particles get invested in and kind of grow. Um, so you always want this sort of requisite variety that you're ready to handle these different surprises. Um, and an outbreak occurs, you've got a bunch of particles on that already. That's one of the reasons why as the state space of the model goes up to explore the set of possi possible situations, you need more and more particles. With our COVID-19 model, it's hundreds of thousands. With that, with that particle, uh, the model for measles she was looking at, a four compartmental model plus a little bit for the parameters, she, she did it with only 5,000. But you know, if you can do it with more, you can have more of these particles that are more speculative and are more um, exploratory um, so that they're waiting in the wings and if no outbreak takes place or no unexpected thing, they'll kind of die out. They'll die out. They'll die out. But if, but more of them are being produced over time. But if something unexpected happens and there's a turn, an earlier outbreak than you expected, or a new variant comes in, or you know, you know, people start because of some some disinformation, start you know, removing masks in larger numbers or whatever, start avoiding social distancing or, 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 or what have you, they, um, the model's ready to, to capture that. Um, so, so this is a balance. It's a practical balance, but it's also a philosophical balance we have for the models. And, 
you know, if you understand this about your model, you can tune your model to really good effect to, to perform very well. And you get someone like Cha Yan on it and she can bang a model into shape um, in ways that, that almost no one else can. It's, it's amazing. Um, okay, now I, beyond this though, I, I wanna talk about um, uh, a bit about important sampling. So I've been saying that there are these weights and a weight of 0.2 means that particle is twice as represented in this distribution of, rep of, uh, of the model as one with a weight of 0.1. And I, I call them importance weights, but that doesn't really give you that much. And, and I wanna, I want to give you a little bit more clues as to what's going on here. You know, in a, in a more fulsome treatment, like in some of my classes, I'll dive down into this for, you know, um, lectures on, on sort of the, the, the what and the how of particle filtering mathematically in terms of how it's implemented. Uh, have, a, have at least a, a lecture each or maybe two lectures and one and one and the other. We don't have time for that, but, but I want to give you a key intuition. So, so once again, we have a distribution here. What's this distribution? Well, it's, well, before, earlier today, we were looking at a distribution over, remember if, if, if the, value, the um, variable associated with this was actually theta, it was the parameters. That's what we were sampling from in MCMC. We were drawing values for these parameters. Um, uh, and, and, and there was some of that going with approximate Bayesian computation in a crude way. What are we doing here with particle filtering? Well, it's it's not it's not over parameters. No, no, no. It's it's over latent state of the system. It's over the state, the complete state of the system. We have a, a distribution over these hypotheses about the state, and that includes changing parameters. Maybe the contact rate is evolving, or the reporting rate is evolving within some bounds, but but it's a distribution over that, a joint distribution. I'm, I'm drawing it in one dimension, you know, with the vertical dimension being probability here for simplicity. But the idea is that we have different possibilities, different hypotheses, right? Each, of the, each hypothesis in a particle is representing a curtain sort of possibility of, of what the state of the system is. And some of them are more plausible than others. And I'm saying that, the, the weight has something to do with it. In fact, the weight's going to tell us how well represented is going on. So I, I want to under I want to help communicate the intuition for it because if you do, you'll head off some misunderstandings that could cause you to make grave errors um, with this. So and and what's going on here is actually quite simple if you understand it as important sampling. So this gets back to a very simple idea. Suppose we have, and, and students may be surprised by this, suppose we want a sample from a distribution. Um, so we want a sample from some distribution out there. Um, you know, many students these days grow up around packages, software packages, whether it's SPSS or Stata or SAS or R or, you know, um, a Sage or, or or MATLAB or whatever, where where you just call and you say generate a random number, you know, from a normal distribution, or from a log normal, or from a beta or whatever. But imagine you don't have that. Okay, imagine all you can sample from is is a stinking uniform distribution. That's all you got at your disposal. And now suppose you want you actually want to sample from something different. We want maybe we want to sample from this distribution. You may never have thought about it, but gosh, you know, if we had a distribution shape like this, this told us the probability of getting each value. How do we, how do we like grab values with the probability of each being given by this, the height of this curve? You know, you could imagine this being a normal distribution. How would I draw values from it with a probability of each being given by the height of the curve? And so I get more in the center and fewer away, or I get more near this peak and fewer here and more here and fewer here yet and more here. How, how would I do that? Um, 
um, that that's an important question, and and you know it can leave students stumped. Um, um, how to how to do it in general, and there's this cool technique called important sampling for for doing it. Um, and particle filtering is based on sequential importance sampling. Um, and if you understand this, you'll understand what these weights mean. You don't have to actually worry about doing this 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 stuff. It's all done for you. But if you understand what the weights that these are importance weights, it'll make sure you don't make a silly mistake. Um, so, so the idea here for important sampling is look, okay, so we'd like to sample from this, but we're gonna we're gonna sample instead from something we can easily sample from, from a proposal distribution. And what's our proposal distribution gonna be? Uh, it's gonna be a uniform distribution. So, okay, I don't know how to do this. So I'll just sample from a uniform distribution. Okay, that's step one, gets you some sample. And then and the question is, can we, gosh, can we somehow frob these samples, somehow treat them so that if we get a bunch of samples from a uniform distribution, I could somehow render them rumple stilt skin like into samples from this distribution. Um, is there some way, you know, by first sampling from a uniform distribution, I can render those into something that looks all the world like sampling from this? And the answer is yes. And it's the idea of important sampling. So what do you do? You first sample from a proposal distribution. And then not all those samples are treated equally. They're associated with weights. And if, if it's a sample that's coming from some place that's like way out here, we give it a really low weight because we see almost none of those. We get a lot of them from the, from the uniform distribution, but we see very few out here. I, I have a, a nice graph here. So if we, if we sample one of these, we'll give it a really low weight because you're very unlikely to see that. The ratio of this, um, this blue curve, the value of the blue curve to the value of at the, for the uniform distribution is very low. So we'll give it a really low weight. Something like this, oh man, that's, we'll give it, we'll upweight it. We'll give it a higher weight because it's actually more likely for the one we really want to sample. This one, oh, they're equal. So it'll be a weight of one. Here it'll be a weight of one. Here it'll be a weight less than one because the blue is less than the red. This will be a weight of more than one. And so we'll, we'll sample from this, proposal distribution, that should be a Q there. Um, uh, but we won't treat those all as just the same. We'll, we'll give them weights. And, and those weights will reflect the relative abundance of, of, those, of that value in the, the thing we actually want to sample with compared to the, um, to the, to the proposal. It'll depend on, on this ratio. Um, so if it's something we like almost never see here, this will be really small because this will be tiny compared to this. By contrast, if it's something we see a ton here compared to this, like this guy, we'll give it a, a higher weight. Okay, well, that's, that's kind of cool. So we assign this weight to it. And well, okay, then what do we do with these weights? So we have, we have these things we drew from here and then we have each of them is associated with the weight. And then, okay, now here's the key idea. And here's what you always do always do in particle filtering. You have these samples called particles labeled by weight, and you never, ever, ever draw from them without weighting it according to their weight. You, you never just draw you know, blindly to the weight. No, no, no. You, you draw a given particle with a probability proportional to its weight. So if it has a weight of 0.2, it'll be drawn twice as frequently as a way to point one. Um, and it turns out that's really easy to do. Once you have these things labeled by weight, um, it's quite easy to kind of reach in and grab one with a proportion according to its weight. Um, uh, that's, that's a very easy thing to arrange. Um, and, and that's what we do with, uh, with important sampling. Um, uh, and so we always here draw it with a probability according to its weight. So, so what do we do? We draw first from the proposal distribution, okay? And then we e label each one that's drawn with a weight, which is the ratio of these two, uh, of these two, just the value of, of that 
probability uh, for each of these distributions. So if it's much more frequent here, it's a weight that's quite large above one. If by contrast, uh, it's very small here, it'll be a weight very small. And then we normalize the weight so they sum to one. And then, and then we draw samples from this normalized set uh, with, a, with a probability for, for one. And, and I give a little formula for how you can do that. Um, you draw a form, uh, value from zero to one and you kind of go through each one until you, you, you find the weights totaled up, get to that point. Um, and, and this is really easy to do. Now, um, as you can imagine, if you have a really poor proposal distribution, like if your proposal distribution has, has really, as we say, long support, it really extends way beyond where you want a, the target distribution. Um, it should be kind of over here. Um, then, then you're going to produce lots of these particles with really low weights, which is going to be a really, you know, it's going to be needlessly carrying around a sack that's full of garbage. You know, it, it has no value. Um, what you really want to do is have a proposal distribution that has, you know, some broad features of this. At least it's matched support-wise too here. Um, and so particle filtering is um, is approximating a, a distribution here uh, with a set of particles each weighted. So it's like we 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 want to represent this distribution with a set of samples from it, um, and we carry around a bunch of samples with the frequency of samples for these high values are are very very frequent, and for these low ones are are infrequent. That's what we have in the particles in particle filtering. And when we, do, when we do resampling, we draw from these weighted ones with the probability according to their weight. Um, and when we plot them out, or when we compute means or compute medians or, or ask, is this intervention better than that? Or, or what have you, we're always drawing with a probability according to their importance weight, um, which is based on, on this ratio. And you may ask, well, what is this target distribution in, in uh, particle filtering? Well, it's the target distribution is the probability of a given state of the model, given the data all the way to that point. And it can be proven that this algorithm that I've given you, where you kind of run the particles and you multiply their weights every time by the likelihood, you can show that you're in fact sampling from, um, if once you consider the weights, you're doing important sampling from the distribution of states of the model that's implied by all the observations thus far in the likely functions um, you know, uh, that, that, that you're using. Um, so when we're performing particle filtering, we're performing important sampling. And these weights we're carrying around represent a key thing in order to have a correct representation of the distribution. We always draw from the particles with the probability of drawing each proportional to its weight, just as we do with, uh, with important sampling. So in order to illustrate this, um, I have a little bit of R code, which I provided to you. So. Um, uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, I am going to draw from uh, a, so I'm going to show you a distribution I want to draw from, okay? This is the distribution I want to draw from. It's a funky looking distribution. Uh, this is what I want to draw from, suppose. Um, that's what I'd like to draw from, and I don't know how to draw from, suppose. Um, I'm plotting it out for you, but just imagine I don't know how to draw from it. Imagine it's a beta distribution, but imagine I don't have a call to, to generate beta distributions. This could be any distribution. You could draw it out and I could sample from it in this way. How would I do it? Well, I draw from this in two steps. The first thing is I would draw from a proposal distribution, which I can get, and, and that'll be a uniform distribution. This is our studio, and I provided this code is up on the site up on the bootcamp site. So here I'm gonna draw from a uniform distribution. Okay, um, and I'll show what it looks like. It looks like that. 
And you could be excused for saying, wait a minute, that doesn't look anything like that. Um, that doesn't look anything like that. Well, yeah, remember, this is just my, this is my proposal distribution. That's this, this Q. I'm, I'm, drawing, I'm drawing from this Q of X here. Um, drawing with probability according to Q of X, but I'm not done. Now I gotta get my weights. How am I gonna get my weights? Well, I'm gonna set my weights for any given point that I've drawn from Q of X. I'm gonna see for the value of that, right? This is, these are values along here. Um, what's the ratio of uh, the value for the target distribution, that funky looking thing I wanna sample uh, compared to the proposal distribution and divide them and I take that ratio. Like here, this would be, you know, maybe 0.3 or something like that, or 0.25. So for everything I drew, all these proposal samples, which are all draws from this uniform distribution, um, uh, I am going to evaluate this ratio and give it a weight. There we go. So each and every one of those, I'm going to have, you know, associated uh, a, a weight. So here are the various weights. Some weights are, are above one, some are below one, and I'm, I'm not gonna bother normalizing. Okay, um, and, and that's great. So each of these samples that I drew from this uniform distribution now has a weight, which, and that weight represents how frequently that sample occurs for what I really wanna sample from, that funky distribution versus this one here. Now, in order to do that, all I needed to do was evaluate the value of that density, of that, 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 of that, um, uh, that uh, distribution I want to sample at each of these points. I don't have to sample from it. I just have to get a value of what's the value of it at that point compared to the value here. Of course, I want to sample for it, but that, that's going to come in a minute. First, I... I, I determined the weights by the ratio of these of these densities or these probabilities if it's a discrete distribution. Okay, great. So I have these weights. Every one of these values that I drew from the uniform is associated with weight. They're not all equal. Some are associated with weights indicating they're a lot more frequent. Take a look at this. Like this one here is, is about twice as frequent as this one, which is in turn about twice as frequent as this one. Um, so there's real differences in the, in the frequency of these things. So here are these weights. And now I'm going to sample from these samples with a probability given of drawing each one by the weights. So, so I have these bunch of sam samples. If, if I were to just draw the proposal samples, I get exactly this here. But if I now sample from them with a probability given by each one's weight, I do that. And then I draw the histogram for that. Well, there we go. I have in effect so these two steps drawing first from the proposal distribution and then drawing, then weighting and then drawing from those weighted ones with a probability equal to the weight I have drawn in essence, from the original target distribution I wanted to draw from, but didn't know how to. Sorry for the English. So um, that's a two-step process for being able to draw from any distribution. And all it requires you to know is the value of this or the relative value of this, um, uh, of this probability at, at each of these points. And that's what particle filtering can can allow us to do is to sample from this with a probability of each uh, according to its weight. Um, so that's the idea of important sampling. And that's why you never, ever, ever just treat all the particles as equal and ignore their weights. No, when you want to plot them out, when you want to compute statistics on them, when you, when you want to summarize whether you know, uh, the results of one intervention, one scenario are, are bigger than the other. You're always drawing from the according to their weights. Um, you never consider them in an unweighted fashion. Um, so that's a bit about important sampling. And it's a really neat technique 
for sampling from an arbitrary distribution, drawing samples from it without, uh, you know, with just by starting with another distribution. And you may ask, what is the starting distribution we start with here? It's what's generated by running the simulation model. And what we want to do is to inform that by the observations from the world. Um, we want to start with what the simulation model itself will give us running from the last observation point. And then we want to um, adjust, we want to determine the weights or upweight things that are, are more likely given the observed data and downweight those that are less likely. Um, so that's the idea of important sampling here. It's a key and central idea here. And, um, uh, and if you remember it, you know, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll understand why weights are so critical. They're not this little niggly piece of information that's unnecessary that, that, we, that we have no reason to keep around and it's just an annoyance. No, 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 it's, a, um, it's, it's not some small negligent thing, it's a, it's, it's something we could ignore. No, it's, it's absolutely central for, for running, um, running it properly. Okay, so those are all my, um, um, all my comments um, on this lecture. Any questions here? Any questions about this? Okay, um, I'm not seeing any um, hands here. So I think what we'll do is uh, we'll break here. Um, why don't we take a, I'm, I'm conscious of the, uh, the fleeting time here. Why don't we take a 10 minute break and we'll resume here and uh, we'll talk about wastewater and about particle filtering that, that uh, has an inordinate appetite for rendering wastewater into gold, a bit like Rumpelstiltskin with straw into gold. So we'll see you in 10 minutes uh, for turning wastewater into gold. Thanks very much. <laughs>